good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mario Pagliariel. I'm the director of supervisory strategy and risk at the ECB. Uh, it is a pleasure to open this conference and to welcome you uh, at this uh, first uh, annual uh, ECB Banking Supervision Research Conference. I'm happy to see many of you in person here in Frankfurt, so thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and there are also a lot of people joining uh, online. Actually, the response to our uh, web uh, uh, invitation was uh, really overwhelming. I think we got uh, uh, almost 500 people registering uh, and almost from all uh, uh, continents. But I hope the conference will be interactive not only for the people in the room, but also for those uh, connected online. Uh, the conference brings together uh, uh, researchers, supervisors, uh, uh, regulators, and the financial industry. And I think uh, for us is a very good chance uh, to look a bit beyond our daily supervisory tasks uh, and get uh, some insights from, uh, from research. Sometimes there is a bit of uh, diffidence between uh, uh, supervisors and researchers. Uh, with the former too busy with uh, what they say very serious supervisory tasks uh, and the latter finding those tasks a bit boring topics uh, for, uh, for research. Uh, I think the aim of this uh, conference is to show that this is not the case and there are benefits and merits in uh, uh, exchanging views and sharing uh, uh, analysis. Uh, over the next uh, one day and a half, uh, we, will be, we will be discussing uh, uh, topics which are relevant for banking supervision but go well beyond uh, uh, banking. Uh, first is the uh, climate change, how to cope with, uh, with these risks, uh, and also the second one will be how to manage uh, digital transformation. Uh, we really look forward to get uh, new ideas uh, and uh, better understand the complex interactions between uh, supervisory actions, uh, uh, the uh, impact uh, on the banks, uh, and the overall economic implications. And from the discussion, I'm sure we will draw lessons on how to overcome the uh, challenges ahead of us and how to improve supervisory policies and practices. A uh, bit of housekeeping uh, for the uh, press in the room, a kind of reminder on the media policy. All sessions are on the record, uh, therefore you will be free to uh, report uh, on each session and each paper uh, which is presented, but all the conversations uh, with the conference participants taking place on the sidelines are strictly off the record, unless uh, otherwise agreed bilaterally. Uh, before starting, also, I would like to thank a uh, uh, lot of people, and actually this is not the full list of people I should thank, the program, the program committee in the first place, uh, Rosenbeck was uh, uh, chairing the, the program committee, uh, the organizers, uh, uh, Andreas uh, Bayer, Klaus Duhlmann, Monica Bambura and Britta Bertram, and the colleagues from DG Communication, Stefan Seitz uh, and Nasser Anafi and their teams uh, for setting up this venue. Uh, thanks also to all the colleagues uh, uh, behind the scenes who ensure the smooth working uh, of, the, uh, of the event, which is a bit uh, sort of, you shouldn't see at the beginning, it would be better to wait for them, but let's see. Let's be optimistic on this one. Uh, I think now we can start the uh, conference with a conversation on the uh, progress made in the banking sector and the risks uh, looming ahead between uh, Luke Levin, the Director General of Research at the ECB, and the Chair of the uh, ECB Supervisory Board, Andrea Ria. I wish you all a productive uh, conference, fruitful discussions, and I leave the floor to Luke and Andrea. Thank you. All right. Uh, good afternoon. It's uh, a real pleasure to be here. It's um, anything but dull, I can tell you. Yes, I'm one of those researchers that I was just referring to. Um, and I have this feeling we're in a sort of a calm before a storm. Yes, there have been some hiccups already along the way, and I see some friends from the Federal Reserve. We can tease them in the breaks, but uh, it's, it's, it's an exciting time um, for the SSM as well. And so the theme of today's conference is very broad. It's about banking supervision and its interaction with the economy, uh, covering digitalization, climate change, and also financial innovation. So, Andrea, I would like to start with also a, com a conference-related question, which is the following. Uh, with the rise of financial technology and new players in the industry, many are wondering what is going to happen to these traditional banks. Um, have we seen uh, the, the last of those, those type of creatures? Are they going to lose profits and market share? And more generally, how are they adopting to this new financial landscape? So my question is, what are your thoughts on this digital transformation and its impact on the banking industry? 
Thank you. Thank you, Luke, and uh, uh, good afternoon to all of you. First of all, let me say that I'm very glad that we have this conference. Uh, you remember when I joined some years ago, we discussed how to develop a sort of research agenda on supervisory matters. So I'm very glad that before I leave, let's say we managed to have uh, a first uh, research conference. On, on digitalization, uh, let's say the, the, the short answer to, to your question is that uh, I think that banks uh, uh, can manage to still thrive you know, in the new uh, digital world, uh, but probably not all of them will. So there will be winners, winners and losers. Um, I think that the first uh, uh, battlefield you know, where we saw the, the dynamics developing has been payments. You know, in the area of payments is where uh, fintech, uh, fintech companies have been most uh, aggressive and successful in challenging, uh, in challenging banks. Um, I think that banks were uh, for a long time no, uh, uh, leveraging on their mono monopoly on, uh, on deposit taking no, to uh, uh, capture, let's say, the payments market and they were actually not, uh, not providing probably the most uh, efficient and, uh, and uh, uh, customer friendly service there. And also the legislators started opening the market no, for initiation of payments to fintech companies. And that is where, let's say, the, the, uh, the dynamics became uh, quite, uh, quite harsh for the banks. Um, the attitude of the banks first was to be very defensive, no? trying to call for level playing field, try to you know, uh, basically protect themselves, push back on the legislative changes. But eventually they understood that they needed to engage. And I think they did so. I think they developed uh, their own in-house fintech companies. They acquired some fintech companies. They, especially they developed partnerships with the fintech companies and they recovered, I think, competitive edge. So I think this is a little bit a, a story that can happen throughout different, uh, different areas. And I think that COVID uh, crystallized this new awareness in the banking sector that they need to transform digitally their, uh, their franchise. Um, still, let's say we have done a survey you know, uh, at uh, the SSM. Uh, we published the results in the supervisor newsletter. And we saw that uh, many, although let's say almost all significant institutions now have say that they have a digital transformation strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them do not have investments, budget lines that match this strategy. Um, many of them do not have the skills that match this strategy, both in terms of staff and knowledge in the board. And uh, uh, many of them, which is our concern from the supervisory perspective, do not have the uh, risk management probably capabilities to uh, Let's say they've not revised their risk management in such a way to match these new, uh, these new challenges. Um, and recently we've also seen probably that there could be a dark side to digitalization in terms of uh, speed with which customers can leave you, know, uh, depositors especially, uh, but more generally customers can become much more choosy you know, in the way in which they compare and contrast the conditions offered by different banks. So these all can lead to you know, some banks you know, losing competitive ground and maybe uh, you know, not, being not having more any more sustainability in their business model. So there will be casualties, I think. But all in all, I don't think this is uh, the end of the banking sector as we know it. Um, so so one of those recent casualties overseas was Silicon Valley Bank. I'm sure you also front page news and more recently, basically yesterday, the First Republic Bank. Um, so some of the writings about this bank was, I mean, at least in my mind, sort of a traditional bank run. Is, is this how we should think about these casualties or is there a different dynamic to it? What's your view on that? Uh, you're right. I mean, the, the, it's. Uh, I mean, there are some things. I was reading through the uh, the reports published by the Federal Reserve and the FDIC during the weekend, uh, and many things are, you know, traditional uh, elements in almost any crisis. No poor management, uh, uh, poor governance. Uh, uh, sometimes also the difficulty on the supervisory side to escalate, no supervisory corrective action in these fields fast enough. So things that we know we are grappling with ourselves to some extent. Um, there was this issue of unrealized losses, 
um, which I think is uh, is still to some extent uh, uh, open. No, uh, um, I saw that in the U.S. some observers uh, um, compared uh, uh, SVB Silicon Valley Bank to Continental Illinois, no, which was a bank in the past where there was this run, this violent run on deposits. The bank for which actually was coined the term "too big to fail," if I remember well. Um, I think that if there is a similarity of Silicon Valley Bank is more with Dexia, no? Uh, Dexia in 2011, I remember it was the first stress test I was doing at the, at the uh, EBA, you know, and came out rather positively with the stress test, no? If you look at the books uh, uh, as they were, but if you took a mark-to-market view of the book, the bank was basically uh, without capital, no? And uh, the interesting point is that there are moments in which investors switch very fast from the balance sheet view to the mark to market view of banks. And, uh, and this can happen very fast. So I think we need to reflect a little bit what this tells for us. No? In the European Union, we are a bit better off than what was the case for Silicon Valley Bank in terms of regulatory treatment because uh, the, we apply the liquidity coverage ratio the compliance is checked uh, on a mark-to-market basis, and uh, the, for the assets which are booked in the available for sale, we factor the losses into capital. So it's not by chance that if you look at the IMF, they publish a report, a, a chart recently, in which they show that uh, if you take all the unrealized losses to capital, the impact for U.S. banks is much larger than for uh, for. Uh, European banks. I think the median is 250 basis points for the European banks is 50, less than 50 basis points. Um, still, let's say we too, uh, let's say, basically consider the, uh, H, the, the liquidity buffers <coughs> at, uh, in the liquidity buffers also assets which are held at amortized cost. And I think that this is something that we should reflect on. Maybe if you have a liquidity buffer, you should be always able to sell these assets uh, a short notice, so having um, these in accounting books uh, at market value would be better. And the other point is the is the um, the speed of uh, uh, deposit outflows. Now that was really uh, never experienced pre precedently, no. And uh, and we need to reflect a bit whether this is idiosyncratic or whether you know that there, there are some structural elements at play there. Mm -hmm. Of course, we know that the bank was uh, the banks in the U.S. did these ones that went underwater at a highly concentrated deposit base, uh, mostly uninsured. Uh, uh, so there, there are specific features. There is also a peculiarity post-COVID. No, there was this huge increase in deposits during COVID, and there was a natural, you know, reduction uh, that maybe took place and uh, at an accelerated pace in some cases. Uh, but we also reading the reports from the colleagues in the US, I mean, you also see that maybe social media digitalization could have played uh, a, a role in this, uh, in this dynamic. So we need to think a bit about that going forward. So uh, <clears throat> Thomas Jefferson famously said that it's, um, that, that banks like the ones you just referred to are, are more dangerous than standing armies. Um, and um, indeed, I think the, the press is not only full with individual cases, but in general, this sort of a growing agony around banks. Um, again, the usual discussion of bad banks, especially big banks. And at least in the US, uh, JP Morgan again grew in size yesterday tremendously. So I wanted to ask you what these recent bank failures in your mind mean for sort of the post regulatory post, let's say, financial crisis, regulatory reforms we've seen. You mentioned already liquidity requirements. I mean, have they broadly been successful? Is more needed? Are we on the right path? As I was saying, I think it would be a mistake to jump the gun and move to wholesale uh, regulatory reforms. All in all, uh, the, uh, the regulatory reforms we put in place uh, uh, served, uh, served us well. I think that the, the, the banking sector was more resilient. We have to remind ourselves that some of the banks that went underwater were not actually uh, you know, requested to comply with the, the full monty of the, 
of the Basel, uh, of the Basel standards. Liquidity buffers, indeed, there might be some assumptions on the outflows of liquidity that might need to be fine-tuned. But again, I, I think we should also find the balance between regulation and supervision. No? So we couldn't calibrate the, the, required, the, stand, the international standards to a, a very extreme business, to cover every business model in the world, even very extreme ones. No? So there are cases in which you need to leave leeway for the supervisors to, ad, to uh, uh, you know, to apply add-ons of liquidity, for instance, uh, for banks which have a, a business model relying extensively on an insured deposit. So I think we would be, we should be careful to adjust, uh, uh, to adjust too much uh, the, uh, the the regulation uh, so far. But there are suggestions in the reports issued by our U.S. colleagues that, of course, we should discuss at the international tables. Mm -hmm. So another debate that's ongoing, especially in the US, is about deposit insurance. You referred to that already. Um, so let's say Warren Buffett earlier this week, he wrote that it's right now it's better to invest in a financial cripple as long as uh, Uncle Sam is behind it. And, you know, I don't look at ratings and capital anymore. Um, but yeah, I guess the general push is for even further larger scale insurance of deposits, maybe full amount of deposits. And essentially, the US government has sort of walked in that direction by using the systemic risk ex exception, right? So do you think that way is, is the solution with deposit insurance? Or are you worried about more hazards? Let me say, uh, first of all, that the systemic risk exceptions should not be seen as uh, uh, something that bad. I mean, we argued as ECB in the past, in our own opinion, uh, that having a systemic risk exception could be a good idea. The IMF, actually, in the Article 4 on the Euro area, argued that we should introduce it. Many jurisdictions have it. And I think that uh, we do have this... Uh, problem in the European Union that because of lack of trust between uh, member states, between authorities, you, we tend to write everything in the marble of rules. No, we never leave enough leeway to authorities sometimes to, you know, uh, have the flexibility to adjust the case that you have at hand. So um, uh, I don't think that the systemic risk exception is, is a bad thing in itself. Uh, having said that, uh, let's say I, I, I read, uh, no, I've not yet digested the FDIC uh, report on deposit insurance, so I, I, I just skim through it. Uh, I must say I'm a bit skeptical about the need to increase depositors' coverage. Um, my, my impression is that uh, either you go the full monte of, uh, uh, you know, uh, full coverage for all deposits, which would be an issue in terms of moral hazard, in terms also of cost uh, uh, for, the, for the whole industry. But if you come short of that, um, we have seen it in the case of uh, Northern Rock, no? when, when you add in the UK co-insurance, so 90% only coverage. If you only have to lose 10% or even less, of, you will push the, the deposits out in any case. No? Uh, uh, so I don't think that uh, that, that this is going to increase in the bar, increasing the coverage is going to uh, stop panic runs. So all in all, I think we have to leave uh, with, a, with, a, with an only you know, partial deposit. The one we have is um, and working decently. I would not, uh, I would not support uh, at the moment. I mean, I need to, of course, there is, needs to be a debate, but I've not seen a compelling evidence for, for raising the bar yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So I would like to take you a bit closer to home and um, maybe also slightly away from fo the focus primarily on banks, but also their interaction with the real economy. And maybe actually a little bit closer to my day job on monetary policy. Um, because now for pretty much a decade, we've experienced very low interest rates and banks were complaining about low rates and now they're complaining about high rates. And so I'm trying to Make, make get my head around it and make sense of it. And, um, and I think it's fair to say that uh, one, of, one of the side effects of this rapidly rising rates to fight inflation has been some financial turbulence we have seen in financial markets. Um, so is that of concern to you from a euro area bank stability perspective? Is there more to come? You see that? 
We have uh, uh, looked into the impact on increasing interest rates uh, in the in the bank's balance sheets and PNL for some time now. No, we started already at the end of 2021. Our conclusion has always been so far that uh, uh, higher interest rates uh, are good news for European banks. I mean, we have seen in 2022 uh, the net interest income increased by 15%. Uh, and if you look also at the projections for 2023, even 2024, let's say both the bank's models and our models tell us that the, um, the, the positive effect on interest margins is uh, more than compensating the uh, expected negative effect on uh, uh, asset quality, on uh, customers not being able to uh, pay back their, their loans uh, um, as, as due. Um, now, should we trust uh, uh, our <laughs> models and uh, the bank's models? Uh, uh, to some extent, uh, we didn't do a proper job in the past, no? In the past, we were overshooting in terms of conservatism, in terms of thinking that the, we would have had a, a, a tsunami of, uh, of uh, NPLs, of deterioration of asset quality uh, as a result of COVID. So we, we might got it, get it wrong this time as well. So I think we need to be extra cautious no? in any case. And that's why we have been, since a while now, pushing banks to uh, uh, put uh, their focus not only on the earnings perspective, where the impact is likely to be positive, but also on the economic value of equity, for instance, so on the impact that this could have on the net worth mm -hmm. of the banks, so considering mark to market all their assets and liabilities. Um, and their funding costs, especially. Um, uh, putting more attention on, uh, on uh, asset quality, you know, and uh, especially on those sectors that are particularly sensitive to increasing interest rates, commercial, residential real estate, uh, consumer finance, leverage finance, uh, uh, and, uh, and also from the bank side, take proactive action when they see any signal you know, of deteriorating asset quality. So, uh, and finally, I think also, there is also the issue that, I mean, is always there, but uh, uh, of non-bank financial institutions. I mean, these are entities that we know very little about, you know, but uh, uh, they have taken a major role in financing the higher level of leverage that we have in our economy so far. No? Uh, so um, it might be that uh, that is an area also where which we need to keep uh, under watch. For us as bank supervisors, the entry point is main, mainly counterparty credit risk. No, so I think that these are the areas that we should keep a, a close eye on. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you referred already to too big to fail. Uh, one more recent example that comes to mind that we haven't touched on is uh, in Switzerland, Credit Suisse, and uh, the merger with UBS. And you also mentioned Continental Illinois in the 80s, uh, I think it was 88, when um, which coined the uh, too big to fail, as you said. And in comparison, that was a tiny bank. Uh, Credit Suisse, uh, even at the time of its failure, having shrunk half its size, to have its size was still, let's say, half of Swiss GDP, more or less, depending on how you count mark to market or not. But anyway, th my, my question is whether um, sort of too big to fail uh, resolution is done the right way, especially sort of merging already two large entities in the case of Switzerland. And I would like to add sort of the more recent case that I already mentioned on JP Morgan uh, earlier this week being offered to take over First Republic Bank in the US. So, so this type of merges that create banks that have a very large share of particular deposit markets, is that something that you think is desirable or sometimes that's the only solution? Well, first of all, let me say that uh, uh, as supervisors, we should be thankful to the Swiss authorities for having uh, uh, solved the issue of Credit Suisse uh, during the weekend. Now, when you have a, a globally systemic important institution uh, going underwater, you know, the first priority mm -hmm. is to have the issue dealt with during the weekend and have the critical functions maintained and up and running on the Monday. Uh, if this had not happened, there would have been probably a, a number of negative consequences uh, 
through derivative exposures, uh, securities financing transactions, maybe market infrastructure. So the, the impact could be really, really uh, large. No, so uh, uh, good that the solution was found. I think we should start from that uh, from that point. Um, we had a little bit of a uh, contagion effect through the, uh, the treatment of additional tier one instrument in, the, in, in Switzerland. Uh, we try to go out fast to explain that, you know, that particular treatment that could com convey for a moment the impression to general market that additional tier one could have become junior to equity, you know, in, in resolution. We try to explain that uh, this could not be the case in the contrast of our banks and in our resolution uh, let's say framework, legal framework, and also in our practices. So, um, and I think I hope that these uh, clarify the issue. I mean, I think the key point uh, for too big to fail is resolvability. So, for me, I understand the point on uh, having large shares. Uh, I mean, there are a number of competition issues, uh, which let's say maybe are not for me as a supervisor to some extent. For me, what uh, what matters the most is, is the issue of resolvability. Of course, if uh, Credit Suisse was not resolvable, as the Swiss authorities seem to have conveyed uh, quite starkly you know, after, the, uh, the, in the, after the, 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 the weekend uh, in which the bank was, uh, was sold to UBS, uh, I don't think UBS plus Credit Suisse could be resolvable. No? So we need to understand what, the, what are the drivers of this lack of resolvability. Because to some extent, what they did was a sale of business, not which could have been crafted also under resolution. So we need to understand what are the issues there. And in my view, we need to uh, try and fix that. Because uh, I would not give up on the, uh, on the uh, let's say, resolution strategy. I think that we still have to make an effort to make this work in practice. Because if the, the banks are really too big to fail and need to be bailed out or you know uh, supported uh, in this way, in any case, I think that uh, that will carry important consequences on the functioning of our market. So I think we need to push uh, this agenda further. Mm -hmm. uh, the FSB is working on this. I understand that together with the Swiss authorities, they will come out with a report. So hopefully, we can identify the ways to make further step forward on resolution. Mm -hmm. Okay, so before I turn to the audience, um, give you the opportunity to ask Mr. Emery a question, I, I wanted to touch uh, on the uh, other topic of the conference we haven't spoken about, climate change, which uh, under your leadership, the SSM has embraced very much so, and um, the, you have done a stress test. And as I understand that uh, last year, you concluded that while banks have made quite a bit of progress from the risk management um, perspective to look at climate and environmental related risk. There's still quite some work to be done. And um, so my question is, how do you at the SSM plan to push the banks further to close the, the gap that you identified um, so that ultimately they, they will embrace more and take fully into account climate and environmental risks? I think we have been very structured in the approach to climate risk. Now we set up, we set out our supervisory expectation uh, already back in 2020. Um, and uh, we, we took a purely risk management angle. So what we expect in terms of uh, governance, uh, risk measurement, risk controls, stress testing, uh, uh, pillar three disclosures. Uh, and uh, uh, the banks self-assessed themselves against these yardsticks. They themselves were very candid in saying that there was a significant gap between where they were and where we wanted them to be. And they developed plans. And we started with the stress test, with the SREP, you know, to test uh, the, the, the progress. Uh, and again, they know where we want them to be. And uh, they, they have a timeline, which is by the end of 2024, uh, so we will follow closely this uh, progress and take action if they don't uh, respect their commitments. Mm -hmm. Let me say that we have been quite, uh, I would say, thoughtful in the way in which we structure. Because again, the banks were always complaining, uh, uh, you are pushing us to measure the risk, but we don't have enough data. The data is uh, not of good quality. Our customers don't give us the data. 
And, uh, and I think that what we did was to, um, and this is something that we can do as SSM. This is one of the assets of, the, of having the SSM, not that we can see practices across many banks. Mm -hmm. So there are some banks that have developed good practices in terms of building proxies, in terms of uh, estimating these risks better. So we, we acted as a sort of uh, hub for disseminating good practices also to the industry. If some banks manage to do it, other banks can as well. No? So, and, and these, I think, uh, trigger a good dynamics in the sector. So we hope that we can uh, keep pushing and get uh, the results we expect to have by the end of 2024. If not, we will have an escalation process that will lead uh, banks to you know, uh, come into line uh, uh, sooner rather than later. Thank you, Andrea. Matt, thank you so much for this very also candid reply to, to my questions, which at the time of still some Financial turbulence uh, is rare in the supervisory world, at least based on my little experience. So, I, I, um, this is your chance to ask a question to Mr. Andrea um, and also look at Andrea's if you see questions from the online audience. But otherwise, I have already one hand up here. First come, first serve. So, Thorsten, you're the first, uh, and you will get a mic. Thorsten back. Um, thank you very much, and also thank you, Andrea, for these uh, insightful uh, comments. Um, two questions that follow up on two of your remarks. Uh, first, on the, um, the the changes, or the, the, what you said, the, the digitalization. Not every bank will uh, will achieve the transition, and there will be some variation, which I guess implies that some players might have to leave the market. Which brings us to, uh, I would say, kind of a, a weak point in the um, in the banking union, which is the uh, the resolution part, or the let's say the failure management part. Um, and um, I, I mean, we know that the SRB has so far only, I think, res uh, resolved two or three banks. Uh, most of them are still being res resolved or being recapitalized on the national level. I mean, where do you see this going forward? I mean, so if we want to. Uh, if, he's, if he either expect or even if he want to have a structural change in the banking system, to which extent do we have to rely on a more effective resolution regime on the banking union level? Um, that's my first question. My second question, uh, you mentioned the systemic risk exemption. Um, so I, there's an old, old uh, standing debate about whether um, this kind of should be announced in advance or should there be constructive ambiguity so that people don't know uh, ahead of time whether or not they will fall under such an exemption? Where are your thoughts on this? It's better to have clarity from the very beginning, kind of like, yes, you will be made whole, no, you will not be made whole, or is it better in terms of discipline to kind of uh, keep it ambiguous? Thanks. Well, the first question, first of all, I, I would like to uh, challenge the idea that we have a dysfunctional crisis management framework right now. So uh, let's say we know that uh, it's complex. We have always uh, argued it's complex, uh, but uh, let's say we have a very uh, extremely good cooperation arrangements, collaboration with the SRB. I mean, whenever we have had crisis, eventually we have managed to find uh, uh, pragmatic uh, solutions. Sometimes, uh, you know, uh, uh, juggling different uh, legal frameworks of different member states. Uh, yeah, so that's still a challenge. But I think that we, I would, you know, argue that we, we can do it. Of course, we can do better if the legislative framework is adjusted in such a way to increase the flexibility and the tools that we have. And I think that the um, the CMDI package, the, the recent legislative proposals by the Commission, do exactly that. So they, they are not, you know, uh, pushing for a, a, a major overhaul of the system, but still they they they, they try to, uh, you know, in, increase the room for resolution, also to smaller, mid-sized banks, uh, harmonize the way in which they, they can be dealt with, and especially focus on the financing of. Uh, of crisis management, which is the, the, the sore point. I mean, we do have uh, the same amount of funds. If you take the single resolution fund and the national deposit guarantee schemes, we have the same amount of funds as the uh, uh, FDIC, uh, probably more now, actually, because they've used some. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, 
but we, we, it's very difficult for us to touch this pot of money you know, <laughs> and, uh, and to actively use it to uh, favor a smooth exit of banks uh, from the market because the rules of engagement are very, very, very tough. So I think that the CMDI package would, uh, would help in that, uh, in that respect. On the systemic risk exception, I think it is uh, by construction should not be something giving, uh, you know, uh, a sort of badge to one or the other bank that they would be bailed out. I mean, that would be this very destructive, I think. I think it should be just giving flexibility to authorities to understand why, uh, I mean, in some cases to assess that banks which are not considered particularly large, systemic in normal times in a particular market conditions could trigger a major problem, major systemic problems if they have a, a, an unmanaged exit from the market. So here we need to rely on judgment uh, of the authorities, I think. I also have two questions. First one is related to Luke's uh, point of monetary policy, whether the IMF uh, in the Global Financial Stability Review, they said in the first chapter that there might be uh, trade-offs between financial stability and monetary policy, like for low for long and then very high increase in interest rates. Do you believe whether there are those trade-offs and whether maybe there are the trade-offs, but with good or uh, very good regulation and supervision, trade-offs, uh, these trade-offs wouldn't be there? And then the second question, you said that over, over, the, over the weekend you read the report from the Fed on the Silicon Valley Bank. They were saying basically, apart from bad management, they were basically saying that there was an issue of regulation, no? Because of the changes in 2018 and 19. So there will be regulation. And they were also saying about supervision and the lack of culture of excellent supervision. Uh, do you think, you know, like in the sense of a reduction in the, in the culture of, of supervision associated to to the previous uh, head of the supervision. Do you think like both are necessary? Do you, do you agree on, on this issue about both regulation and supervision are crucial for, for these topics, for this risk? Well, on the first question, you will not get me commenting on trade-offs, monetary policy, financial stability. That's, uh, that's not for a humble supervisor to say. Uh, what I think is that, I mean, the, 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 the normalization of monetary policy was not uh, uh, something that was not expected. Actually, I would say also advocated and uh, uh, eagerly expected by, uh, by banks. Uh, so it has always been clear to us that when this started, uh, uh, we should have, we and the banks should have prepared you know, to take all the risks uh, uh, of, the, of the new environment. Until 2021, we were testing the banks for a, a low for long uh, uh, environment. Uh, uh, so uh, we had to switch quite fast no, to test them on a, a, a higher, faster <laughs> type, of, uh, type of environment. So we need to keep doing that and keep the banks on their toes in terms of managing proactively uh, the risks uh, of a, uh, uh, of a uh, again, of a more stressful uh, adjustment in the interest rate environment. Uh, I mean, we did uh, last year this uh, uh, targeted review on, in, on interest rate and credit spreads risk, and it was clear that many banks still had very, uh, you know, uh, uh, optimistic assumptions no, on the behavior of uh, depositors no, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an environment of, uh, of uh, uh, increasing interest rates or, uh, or also the stress condition, the pass-through assumptions they had were very, they were still complaining quite a lot about the pass-through assumptions in the stress test that we are running right now together with the EBA. You know? So I think that uh, it's important that we keep the banks focused on those uh, on those topics. And sorry, I, in the meanwhile. Yeah, uh, on, the, on the regulation supervision uh, aspects, let's say supervision, it is clear. I mean, uh, th that's typical. I mean, uh, of uh, uh, there are always uh, uh, moments in which uh, there is a push for supervisors to uh, be sort of uh, enforcer of rules, no? so become very cautious in the way in which they uh, intervene, uh, uh, have always a strong legal basis for any action they take. I think that the point that the report is making very strongly is that uh, as supervisors need to be able to uh, 
you know, to push the banks and uh, to make sure that they uh, take care of the risk they are confronted with in a very, in a very, uh, you know, strong, strong, uh, strong fashion. And uh, supervisors need to be empowered, need to feel empowered, you know, to challenge the banks uh, in a strong, uh, in a strong manner. So that's uh, that's an important element. Depends on the culture of the supervisory authority. I think we uh, spent a lot of effort and time here to build a strong supervisory culture. I, I'm confident that we will uh, do our best to maintain it and to strengthen even further. Uh, on, the, uh, on the rules, let's say, let me make just a comment that uh, one of the points made in the report is, of course, uh, um, there were some decisions taken in the US not to subject some banks uh, of a certain size no, to the, uh, to the uh, stress test. Uh, and uh, uh, international standards. Um, now, we have always been uh, quite uh, proud and fast in saying, well, this is not the case in the European Union. We apply the, the Basel standards to all the banks, which is true. And I think it has been a, a good choice, uh, not something that should be given for granted, because you remember there was a lot of lobbying not to use a two-tier system like in the US, also here in the European Union. So that was a good choice. Still, we are deciding to deviate from a number of international standards, to water down a number of international standards, also in the debates and the legislative packages which are being finalized right now. So I, I hope that uh, you know, this uh, turmoil could have the positive effect of making our uh, co-legislators think twice because uh, any, uh, you know, uh, if there, there will be future crises also in Europe and, uh, and you can be sure that we will be blamed for, not have, for having deviated here or there from, uh, from the international standards. So thank you for your questions, and Mr. Andrea, thank you so much. Uh, I really enjoyed our conversation, and, very, and uh, I wanted to also indeed thank you for your support throughout for research on bank supervision issues. We have a very good collaboration between the two sides of the ECB, and this conference was a long time in the making, and it's a pleasure to see it now coming uh, to life in uh, this very new hybrid setup. So I'm very much looking forward to the rest of the day, and. Please join me in a round of applause for Ms. Henry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, sir.